Good morning, this is Gary Amaralt coming to you from Herman, Missouri, Lake Seatal on Resurrection Day 2015. Yep, Sunday morning. Uh, and we're going to do a Bible study right here on Lake Seatal about some really important subjects. Um, I've never done this before. This will be my first one. Of I'm sitting in front of a huge septic tank that used to serve this community, all the, the garbage and the yuck that came from our houses around this lake would go into pipes and come into a couple of pipes right to the left and the right of me into this huge septic tank with a big metal top. It's really an appropriate place to do this Bible study because the subject that we're going to be talking about. A week before Resurrection Day, Easter, I went to a large Word Faith church, not too far from here, between Warrington and uh, Wright City, in which they presented a program. Oh, poor Christina. The wind is very strong here today, and she kind of wants to uh, go with the wind. So uh, I'm going to have to try to, uh, I don't know. Well, <laughs> she may fall again, but we'll see what happens. Anyway. This particular Word Faith Church, it's a church that believes in divine health and wealth. Um, there are thousands of them in the United States and all around the world. They believe that if you have enough faith, you should be prosperous and you should be healthy all the time. Well, they presented a week before Resurrection Day a program called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames, produced by a company called, uh, a ministry called Reality Outreach uh, in Canada. This team, this, uh, this organization has 30 teams that present this, this uh, program. It's kind of like a play, a media, multimedia play called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. I watched it three evenings in a row. Now, they would canvas the, the, the schools in the community with, with postcards and Facebook presentations and Twitters. They, would, they, they used all kind of social media to get as many people in the community to come watch this hour and a half, two hour presentation to get people saved. And they focused on primarily young people. Young kids, school age, and even younger. I saw kids as young as two years old, three, four, five, six, many in high school. And the purpose of this presentation was to get people to make a decision that in this lifetime, in this short sliver of time, you have to make a choice. If you don't make that choice, you are going to burn be burned alive in a place like this lake behind me with literal flames and you're going to burn there forever and ever and ever. The person that made this presentation used every single fear tactic and, and, and manipulation trick that, that I can imagine. I used to be in sales and also in advertising. So I know all the manipulative tricks that, that large corporations and, and salespeople use. I know them all. He pulled just about every trick that he could to get kids to make a decision of either burn alive in hell forever or enter into heaven's gates. Now the presentation was graphic, very graphic. These little kids, one of the nights when they began the presentation and the music began, one of the kids, little five-year-old maybe, in, in the audience said, this is scary. Well, it was scary. It was terrifying. It was, in my opinion, child abuse. And the community allowed it. The churches allowed it. They had policemen out there uh, uh, doing traffic for, uh, for, for the people that came in and out. There wasn't an outrage in the community that uh, saw this as Christian terrorism and as horrible child abuse. But that's how I saw it. And, and I'm not saying that from a, from a high and mighty place. I'm saying it from a place of having been there. When I got saved in 1985, I had an awesome, glorious conversion. And I experienced a love that was indescribable. I loved everyone. I couldn't hate if you paid me all the money in the world. It was impossible. But after I became a Christian from being an atheist and, and be, began to attend traditional churches, more and more through faulty Bible translations and what I call tra traditions of men that make the Word of God have none effect, 
I swallowed the, the doctrine that most of mankind was going to rot in hell. And I began to preach, and I began to hand out tracts, and I began to beg people to get saved. And I did this for several years until I finally got burned out and so sick of what it was that I was doing, the hypocrisy that I was in, and the hypocrisy of my church. I screamed out to God, just kill me, because I couldn't do this Christian thing anymore. On that very day that I asked God to just take me out of here, a man gave me 14 booklets that I read that was entitled, Just What Do You Mean, Savior of the World? And those booklets transformed my life. They gave me back the joy that I had lost in spending years begging people to be saved from a God who loves them and yet is going to torture them forever and ever for most of mankind in a lake, a physical lake burning lake. So this evangelist gave them a simple choice that even a five-year-old could understand. Turn or burn. Make a decision for Christ and you will escape the flames of hell. But if you don't make a decision for Christ tonight, the very next day, you may find yourself burning alive forever and ever. In one of the parts of the presentation, they had a, a father who was chasing the dollar and the good life and whatnot, and a son, a 13-year-old, who was a jock, and they had just come from a basketball game. Yeah, you're a chip off the old block, just show up like your old man. The dad offered him $20 if he scored 20, 20 points the next game. And, and, and they had a conversation about church and going to, going to church and whatnot. And the, the, and the young, the, the father said to the son, yeah, I really don't have time to, to do the church thing. You know, how do you think you got your, your tablet and, and the nice house and this nice car that we drive in? And the 13-year-old said, yeah, dad, I guess you're right. Well, right after that, the car crashed. They're both in, at the, the, the gates of heaven, and uh, both of them find that their name is not written in the book of life, and both of them are consigned to hell. And, uh, and Satan comes with his little demons in this presentation and drags the 13-year-old and the father into the flames of hell. That's the kind of technique that this outreach reality program and this, this Word Faith Church, that's the kind of technique they used to get kids to make a decision for Christ. Now, this pastor uh, evangelist, he said that when you make that decision, when you make that confession of faith, you have to mean it from the heart. If you don't mean it from the heart, it doesn't, it, it doesn't count. Now, how can a person mean it from the heart to make a decision for Christ, to love Jesus, and to give your life to Him, when you fill it for, for an hour and a half with fear tactics that, that, that were just absolutely horrible? Children should not have been exposed to this thing, and yet parents gladly and pastors gladly brought their kids to this horrible, horrible event. So when they made this uh, presentation, uh, the, the, the evangelist, it was his responsibility to get as many people to come forward as, as possible. And he used every trick in the book to get people who were just wavering to come forward. Uh, I, I won't go into all the details of, of, of the tricks that, that he used. But, but ultimately, he said, if you make your decision, if you come forward and accept Jesus today, you have eternal life. Now, this particular evangelist and his organization, Outreach Reality, teaches a doctrine called eternal security, once saved, that once, uh, once saved, always saved, that once a person makes the decision and they mean it from the heart, they're guaranteed eternal life. But you know what? The church that, that uh, hired this man to come to make that presentation, that church did not teach eternal security. That teach had a list of things that you needed to do to stay right, to be sanctified, to, to, to stay saved. So here we have an evangelist guaranteeing eternal life presented by a church that believes you can lose your salvation. This is called hypocrisy. It's worse than hypocrisy. It's called an outright blatant lie. 
Now, I don't know which one is the greatest liar, whether the evangelist knew um, that he was teaching eternal security and, and was unaware that this particular church taught that you can lose your salvation, or whether the, uh, the, the pastor who had this church knowing that, uh, that they taught that you can lose your salvation, that it was to his advantage to have a, an evangelist come that, that guaranteed eternal security. I don't know who's the biggest liar or who's the biggest hypocrite in this, but it stinks. Now, I'm in front of a septic tank, and that's why I made this presentation in front of this huge septic tank. That doctrine, the thing that I saw on uh, three nights in a row, not too far from here, that whole presentation stank, and it belongs. The teaching that was in that church, it belongs in the sewer. Now in that presentation they had several different scenes and I counted who went to hell and who went to heaven. There were in that presentation there were 10 people and kids that went to hell because they were just regular old human beings that didn't go to church and didn't make a decision for Jesus. And there were 12 that were in heaven. And remember the pastor taught you can lose your salvation even after you're born again, but the evangelist taught eternal security. If you make that decision and you mean it from the heart, even though I just filled your heart full of fear, you'll be saved. Now, I received a uh, testimonial letter from a young man, about 21, 22 years old, uh, a few years back that Oh, the wind is flying everything away. <laughs> mm. Anyway, I received this, present, this uh, testimonial letter from a young man who had gone to these kind of events many times in his life and gave his life to Jesus, but no, nothing ever happened. He never felt secure. He never felt the love of God. He just did it because of fear. Anyway, one day he stumbles into our website and he reads a thing that we have on, our, on the tentmaker.org website called the Hell Test. And he read a bunch of questions that I encourage you right now, whoever is watching this, go to tentmaker.org and read, look up the Hell Test and, and look at the questions there and ask those questions of yourself and see what happens. Here's this young man's testimonial. And it was about that time that I found my way to Tentmaker, and specifically to the page entitled The Hell Test. Many of the questions there were ones I had already asked, but I remembered that there were two verses that I had not focused on before I found, which were Romans 5.18 and Luke 15. I remember that I began crying slightly when I read those, because I felt as though I was reading about myself, that I was the lost sheep whom Jesus had found. Yet despite the similarities of the feeling to the feeling that the evangelical Christians told me that I should feel when I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I could feel there was something fundamentally different, and it didn't take me very long to recognize what it was. Re please, dear uh, viewer here, listen to this very carefully. It's so important. He says, had I been saved as those fundamentalist Christians wanted, I would have felt overwhelming guilt and concern for all the unsaved around me. At that moment, however, all I could do was feel an overwhelming sense of joy, joy that God loves not only me, but my family and friends and the entire world, and that I ought not to fear that I would never see them again after I die, but instead rejoice that not one human being will be denied the saving grace of God's love for his creation. Indeed, it was quite, quite possibly the irony of ironies. I had been told for much of my life that I was going to eternal hell and that I needed to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior right now or else become right now or else I would burn for all eternity. Yet that idea was precisely what prevented me from doing so. And now that I have become absolutely convinced that I do not need to pledge my life to God in order to escape eternal hell, all of a sudden I wanted to. All of a sudden he wanted to. I remember after reading Luke 15 that all I could do was close my eyes and thank God again and again.
I wasn't even sure what I was thanking him for, whether it was for the knowledge that I had newly acquired, or whether it was for the gift of life, or whether it was for something entirely different. But I knew I was very thankful. And I knew that I wanted to devote my life to him because for the first time in my life, I was absolutely certain that he was a just God, a God who would not allow his creation to suffer eternally, a God who was truly deserving of worship. And let me close by saying that I'm very thankful to you as well for giving me finally the resources I needed to cement in my mind the firm belief that Jesus did save the entire world just like he said he would and that God is a kind father who ought to be loved, not an abusive father who ought to be feared. So my precious friend out there who's watching this video, God is love, a love that never fails, a love that you can put your trust and hope in, that your friends, your family, even your enemies will ultimately be drawn into the loving arms of Jesus Christ. We call it the victorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul called it the glorious gospel. Please visit tentmaker.org, visit the Scholar's Corner section, visit the, uh, the Hell Test, and come to the place of being certain that you have a Father in Heaven who is wise enough, powerful enough, and loving enough to draw all mankind to himself. The teaching that most of mankind is going to rot in hell is a lie. It's probably Satan's greatest lie. That lie that's between your ears needs to be removed and put into this septic tank. And if you believe in eternal death, conditional immortality, that God doesn't keep people alive and burn them forever and ever. He just puts them in a lake like this in the back and just annihilates them like, you know, like Hitler annihilated people. That teaching, eternal death, conditional immortality, it belongs in the septic tank too. I've got a bunch of dogs out here that are howling right now and they're amening, they're, amening. they're saying yes, yep. You know, dogs in the Bible were, were, were the Gentiles. The Jews, the chosen people, you know, they put themselves above the rest of the world. You know, they were chosen. Everybody else was a second class. Well, the dogs, Jesus' best friend, the dogs, they will enter into heaven before the self-righteous ones. The, thing, the people that think they're a little bit better than everybody else, the prostitutes and the street centers and the drunks, they will enter heaven before the Pharisees, before the self-righteous. But even the Pharisee, even the self-righteous, even the hypocrite will eventually find their, their, their beings in the loving arms of the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Amen.